This is part five of topic four, diffusion and electrical behavior. In this topic, this part of the topic, we're going to look at activation energy, which is a concept that says how much energy does it take for an atom to move from one position to another position during the process of diffusion. Up to this point when we've talked about diffusion, we really have treated all the materials the same. As long as we had thermal energy, an energetic driving force, uh, and some means or mechanism for diffusion, we assumed diffusion would occur. But diffusion occurs faster in some materials than it does in other materials, and we haven't yet explained why that might be. And that really comes down to this concept called activation energy. Activation energy involves the basically the energy required to move an atom either from one vacancy position to another lattice position or from one interstitial site to another interstitial site. So let's look at vacancy diffusion. In vacancy diffusion, a atom equal to the host atom size moves from one lattice position into the vacant lattice position adjacent to it. While it's moving, it's forced to push the other atoms out of the way, which causes a distortion to the local crystal lattice. This distortion raises the energy of the system. By raising the energy of the system, we create an energetic barrier to the movement of that atom from one position to the next. This energetic barrier is called the activation energy. You can think of it this way. Imagine you had a small wall, and you were bouncing a ball on one side of the wall, and you wanted to bounce the ball over the wall into the other side. In order to do this, you'd have to bounce the ball hard enough, meaning providing enough thermal energy, to get that bouncing ball to jump over the wall. The height of the wall determines how much thermal energy you need to add in order to get past that barrier. In interstitial diffusion, the atom has to also move past two other atoms, but because the interstitial impurity atom is so much smaller, it creates much less lattice distortion. Because of the lower amount of lattice distortion, the barrier to diffusion is much lower, so the activation energy for interstitial diffusion is also lower or the height of the wall is always lower in interstitial diffusion than it is in vacancy diffusion. Here's a table that lists the activation energies, or Q, in joules per mole for a whole host of different types of diffusion couples. Now, a diffusion couple means that we have one element diffusing into another material. So for example, carbon diffusing into iron, FCC iron, requires 137,650 joules per mole in order to diffuse. This value D0 has to do with an equation that we'll talk about later on. Don't worry about it right now. But notice that if I go from FCC iron to a BCC iron, the diffusion coefficient goes down dramatically, about 50,000 joules per mole. That means that carbon actually moves faster in BCC iron than it does in FCC iron. And there's a simple reason for this. Remember the atomic packing factor of FCC iron is much higher than it is in BCC iron. Because the, because the atoms are packed more tightly, carbon has a more difficult time moving from one interstitial site to another, and therefore the activation energy for diffusion is more difficult. Notice that if we compare the activation energies for carbon moving in iron versus nitrogen moving in iron, they're about the same. And the reason for that is that carbon and nitrogen are about the same size atoms. But hydrogen is a much smaller atom, and as we can see, the activation energies for hydrogen to move through iron are much lower, about one-third of the, or to one-fifth of the values uh, for carbon and nitrogen. We can also look at the self-diffusion of materials and look at the activation energies for that. Self-diffusion means moving a lead atom inside its own lead crystal, for example. The way we do this is we tag certain lead atoms as radioisotopes and mo monitor the position of the radioisotopes in the material. As you can see, lead has the lowest activation energy of all the metals listed here, 108,370 joules per mole. If I go to aluminum, the activation energy goes up, and copper even higher, and then iron even higher than that. And in fact, if we were to plot this data as a function of melting temperature, we see an almost linear relationship between the activation energy needed for diffusion and the melting point. So the explanation here is that higher melting point metals have stronger bonds, and therefore the lattice distortion increases the system energy even higher, making it more difficult for diffusion to occur. We can see that another low melting point temperature material like zinc has a close to the same activation energy as lead, but a little bit higher, and that's because it has an HCP crystal structure, which is a brittle crystal structure, but has the same packing factor as FCC.
So we'd expect them to have similar um, activation energies. If we now look at a very high melting temperature material like tungsten, we see that tungsten has almost 600,000 joules per mole because of its high melting point. Covalently bonded materials have also have very high melting points and for that reason have very high activation energies because of the strength of those covalent bonds compared to metallic bonds. There are a number of what are called heterogeneous diffusion couples. Heterogeneous means of two types, different types. So in this case we could look at nickel diffusing into copper and copper diffusing into nickel. And again because copper and nickel are so close in size to one another their activation energies are almost exactly the same. Notice that nickel moving into FCC iron requires about 270,000 joules per mole. That's much higher than it takes carbon, hydrogen, or nitrogen to move into FCC iron. And again, the reason for that is that we have a large impurity atom moving via vacancy diffusion instead of interstitial diffusion. That's going to take a lot more effort to happen. A couple more interesting examples. Oxygen moving in aluminum oxide is extremely high. That's because of the ionic bonds of aluminum oxide resist deformation and therefore make the diffusion more difficult. Well, aluminum does rust even though we don't think it rusts. It oxidizes and forms aluminum oxide. But aluminum oxide, once formed on the surface of the aluminum, is such an amazing barrier to the diffusion of oxygen that further, dif further rusting or corrosion can't happen. A similar phenomenon occurs with magnesium oxide and the diffusion of oxygen into magnesium oxide, although not to the extreme as the case of aluminum oxide. We'll talk more about these numbers in class to make sure that this concept is clear. Remember I said there's that d naught value in the table and that we'd look at an equation later to account for d naught. Well, here's that equation. It's called the diffusion coefficient equation or an Arrhenius equation. Basically, the diffusion coefficient d which is a measure of the speed of diffusion is equal to d naught from the table times the e to the negative qd over rt power or the exponent of negative qd over rt where negative where qd is the activation energy for diffusion r is the gas constant and t is the temperature in kelvin so if i asked you for a given diffusion couple how fast is the diffusion at 300 degrees kelvin you could calculate that value using the data in the table in this equation. Here's a, some graphs that show typical diffusion coefficient values for some of the couples that were in the table. As we can see, hydrogen has the fastest diffusion coefficient. Notice that the, the taller, higher numbers are still very small, 10 to the minus 3 centimeters squared per second. But hydrogen is by far the fastest, and we see that Hydrogen in FCC is slightly slower than hydrogen in BCC, but both are fast. Carbon is also fast, but not as fast as hydrogen. And again, that's because carbon is a slightly larger element than hydrogen. Iron in FCC iron, self-diffusion, is very slow because the large atom requires vacancy diffusion. And notice again that it's harder to move in FCC iron than it is to move in BCC iron. And then we finally see that we have examples like magnesium trying to move in ionic magnesium oxide or calcium and calcium oxide can be very slow for a given temperature because the ionic bonds of the oxides prevent diffusion. And lastly, carbon trying to move in graphite is very difficult. Graphite has strong carbon-carbon covalent bonds which prevent diffusion from occurring. For this reason, we use carbon-graphite composite uh, brake linings for uh, aircrafts so that they can withstand the high heat, all the friction generated during a landing. The picture on the right shows the diffusion coefficients for semiconductors that have been doped with various impurity elements. And the ones that are most important are down here, the group 3 elements and the group 5 elements. What I want you to notice is that the diffusion coefficients are on the order of 10 to the minus 12th to 10 to the minus 16th. That would put them down here on the picture on the left that's a very low diffusion rate. So if we're making a computer chip and we want to make a thin film of boron doping on the surface of a piece of silicon for a photovoltaic cell, it's going to take a long time or very high temperatures to get that diffusion process to occur, something we have to take into account when designing the process. Some applications of diffusion include things like chromium thin films that go on hard drives to protect the hard drive from scratching. Um, soda bottles that are made out of plastic that have a glass lining 
put on the interior to prevent the diffusion of carbon dioxide through the plastic. Thermal barrier coatings for jet engines, they sometimes coat um, turbine blades with ceramics to prevent oxygen from diffusing into the ceramic and attacking and corroding the metal. We put glass fibers in a water vapor proof coating so that you don't lose um, data transmission as the glass is weakened by the presence of water. And we use water treatment membranes and diffuse the water through the membrane and trap the ions and molecules that we don't want coming through um, uh, the membrane. This is also how drugs diffuse through blood vessels into the capillaries and get to your